All right. I want to draw your attention tonight to the Gospel of John. Gospel of John, chapter number 4. And I want to title the sermon, If You Only Knew, If You Only Knew. John, chapter number 4. A lot of you are familiar with this uh, section of Scripture. It's talking about the woman by the well and Jesus' encounter with her. I want to begin reading with you in verse uh, uh, number 3. He left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. Then cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat or food. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that, that living water? Notice how she phrased that, that living water. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidest thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worship in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. For ye worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We'll stop our reading there. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this evening. And thank you for just the privilege of meeting together to open up the scriptures and, Lord, to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And, Lord, we need you. Our nation needs you. Uh, Lord, our church needs you. Christians all across the globe need you. Many are not able to attend their fellowship and uh, Lord I uh, know sometimes in those circumstances the flesh begins to creep in and start taking control and I pray God that you protect the body of Christ, that you would send revival throughout our land and that you would help Christians to set their affections on things above, to seek earnestly your face and Lord help us to help others Lord, to be a blessing to others. Now, we need you tonight, Father. We pray for the sake of Christ that you speak to our hearts through your holy word. 
For it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. John 4, like any other section of Scripture, has many, many different spiritual lessons for us. There's one great lesson here on witnessing to the unsaved. I love to see how tender Jesus was towards this woman that no doubt had lived a difficult life. Jesus uses a natural conversation about water and turns it into a spiritual conversation. That's a good rule for you to follow as well. One of the best uh, questions you can learn to ask another person is, do you attend church anywhere? That at least gets the conversation on the spiritual things. Amen? Jesus was a master at doing this, by the way, turning every conversation into a spiritual conversation. And by the way, Jesus did not overlook the woman's sin issue. Remember, he said, go call your husband. She said, I'm not married now. And he said, yep, the one you're living with, you're not married to. And uh, Jesus had to deal with the sin issue as well. And we have to deal with the sin issue. If men don't see their sin, they'll never see the need of the Savior. Amen? But I want to draw your attention to another lesson. I think there's a lesson here tonight for us in our spiritual life, our spiritual walk. And I want to point out, first of all, the misunderstanding. Jesus asked this woman for water, and she being a Samaritan, which the Bible here mentions how the Jews despised, was even surprised that Jesus would ask of her water to drink. Some Bible scholars say that the Jews despised the Samaritans so much that they would walk completely around the city of Samaritan uh, instead of going through, that, that lest they encounter some Samaritan. Talk about despising a group of people. Samaritans were simply Jews that had married in with Gentiles. They were half Jew, half Gentile. They were not full fully of the Jewish nation and so the Jews uh, arrogantly and wrongly despised them. So the first thing she misunderstood was her relationship to Christ. She thought that Christ felt toward her like others felt toward her. Jesus said, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that uh, saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest ask of him and he would have given thee living waters. Notice her second misunderstanding. Not only her relationship to Jesus, but also her focus on the natural. Immediately, she says, you don't have any bucket to dip into the well. The well is deep. All she could see was the natural. All she could see was the here and the now. And then thirdly, Another misunderstanding she had was that she compared Jesus to others. She compared the Lord to men. Look at verse number 12. Art thou greater than our father Jacob? How many would say, yes, far greater. (laughs) Amen. Jacob was a mess, right? Jesus was not a mess. He was the master. He was uh, God robed in flesh. But... She compared Christ to man. That was the the third misunderstanding that she had. And then fourthly, she wanted material blessings and not spiritual blessings. When Jesus offered her water that she would never thirst again, her thought was, well, let me have that water so that I wouldn't have to come back here anymore and draw more water from this well. She was interested in material blessings and not spiritual blessings. When it comes to our relationship with Jesus Christ, far often we fall into this same type of pattern. These are some of the difficulties that you're going to have to overcome. If you're going to grow and mature and be the person that Christ has called you to be. Now, if we were to ask questions like these, we would probably be able to give the right response. Now, we've been Christianized to some degree. You know, we know the words. We know what's expected, what men 
Christians especially want to hear our response, right? But when it comes to our own walk with the Lord, sometimes we have these same struggles. Sometimes we have these same misunderstandings. Sometimes we have these same problems, right? First of all, notice the Master's response. He said, If thou knewest, Jesus was pointing out to her, I am not your adversary. I'm not like other Jews. She had a misunderstanding about her relationship with Christ and often we have the same misunderstanding about our relationship with Christ as well. Satan does his best to convince Christians, Christians that Jesus is somehow opposed to you. Somehow he is reluctant to aid you or help you. That he doesn't want to be bothered by you. You say, preacher, I don't know about that. Well, Have you ever heard a Christian say... I just don't want to bother him by asking for the same thing over and over again. Have anyone heard another Christian say that? <laughs> Where did they get the idea that they were going to bother him or trouble him? Like that you have to go and pull on his arm because he really is not interested in hearing from you or spending time with you. Now we know that's not true, right? Even in this passage that we read for you, Jesus said he must needs go through Samaria. He went there to meet this woman. He went there to meet her need. This is what we call a divine appointment. He knew who would be there, and he was waiting on her to get into a conversation with her. Not, he wasn't opposed to her. He did he was not wanting to have a relationship with her. He wanted it. He desired it, right? In her view, because that he was a Jew, he didn't want to have anything to do with her. And the opposite is actually true. He went there because he wanted to reach her. He wanted her to experience forgiveness of sin and eternal life. And by the way, if you'll read the rest of that, section in John chapter 4 you'll see praise the Lord she experienced that living water amen she trusted Christ as her savior remember Satan is a liar all the time he tries to convince you of something that is not true something that's untrue if you're ever reluctant to come to Jesus by saying something like oh my sins are just too many I promise you that is not from Christ. That's from the enemy. Amen? Uh, sometimes you may be tempted to say, Lord, I am too ungodly, too unholy. Look at how messed up my life is. You don't want to hear from me in this kind of state. And I'll be honest with you, that is a lie straight from hell. Amen? Jesus loves sinners. Satan does his best to try to convince us that God does not want fellowship with you, that God does not want to spend time with you, that you are way too sinful for God to give you the time of day. Remember Romans 5 and verse 8. But God commended His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us in our loss condition. Amen? Now you're part of the family of God. He loved you when you were in your worst state. The furthest that you've ever been from God. He loved you then as well. Amen? He's always standing with open arms desiring for you to embrace Him. Matthew 11 verse 19 was one of the great accusations against our Lord when He walked on the earth and walked among men. Matthew 11, they're compared, Jesus is saying, you said this about John, now you're saying this about me. And He refers to Himself as the Son of Man. And He said, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber, a friend, a publican, and sinners. 
a friend of publicans and sinners. They accused Jesus of that quite often. Because Jesus was with the lost. He was with the broken. He was with the injured. He was with the diseased. He was with the outcast. I'm just saying to you, if that's the heart that he had for the lost and the dying, now that you're a child of God, don't ever let the devil think or convince you that he doesn't long to have time with you. Remember what the Bible teaches us. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, right? But listen to Hebrews 7, 25. The Bible says this, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. I used to think that meant that Jesus could save people in your community and then to the uttermost ends of the world. (laughs) That's not what that verse is talking about. It means he's able to save you completely, thoroughly. He's able to change you entirely. Amen? Amen? Why? Because he's ever living to make intercession for you. No, he is not through with you at conversion. He is constantly working in your life, longing for you to get closer to him. We studied not long ago through Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, one of the most exciting verses there that gave me great joy. I still rejoice in it. It's Hebrews 2, verse 11. This is what that passage says. It says, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all one. Jesus is the sanctifier. We are the ones who are sanctified and we are one. Amen? But listen to the rest of that verse. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Remember studying that together? He's not ashamed to call us brothers. He's not ashamed of you. Even in your worst state as a Christian, one Sunday here, Brother Pastor, uh, Brother Rick Clyburn was preaching, and he was preaching on Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14, 15, and 16. And pointed out that that verse is there when we have sinned, when we have failed, in our weakness, call on Him. And what will He do? He will give you grace and mercy to help in the time of need. Isn't that a great thought? Don't ever put off coming to Christ because you have sinned or you feel unholy or you feel ungodly. If that's what you're going through, that's the greater reason to run to Christ and seek forgiveness of your sins. Amen? Let me give you one more verse along these lines. Romans chapter 8 or two verses, 16 and 17. I've already been lying. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And as children, then heirs. Is that good? Amen. Romans 8. Amen. If children, then heirs. Heirs of God, and listen, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we have suffered with Him, that we may also also glorify together. Isn't that a great little thought? Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. He loves you, and He wants a closer walk with you. Secondly, Jesus reigns over the natural. She was interested in in temporal things, natural things. Remember, she looked at the well and saw how deep it was. And then she looked at Jesus and said, you don't even have a a bucket. How are you going to get me water? I don't understand how you're going to get me water when you don't even have no way of providing water. Jesus reigns over the natural. He's not your adversary. He's your friend. He's the closest friend that you'll ever have. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Amen? And he reigns over the natural. We look to numbers, 
facts, things, items. And as Christians, that's what we see as well, right? Uh, we look at, you know, what's in the bank account. And we make decisions off of that. Uh, we look at the number in attendance and we make decisions off of that. Uh, and constantly we're doing these things. We're looking at the natural. We're, we're judging things by our physical eyes. And because of that, we're not experiencing the things that Christ wants us to experience. Christ is far greater than just this natural world. And we need to be reminded of this over and over again. He is not limited by natural things, by nature itself. He reigns over nature. The Bible is completely saturated with this truth. From the beginning all the way to the end of the Bible, we see that God is not controlled by nature, but He controls nature. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. And there was light. Amen? And there could be nothing else but light when God speaks. And over and over, God has demonstrated that He has the power to cause the sun to stand still in the sky. I get kind of uh, a chuckle once in a while when people say, do you, do you mean, do y'all think then that the... Uh, sun rotates around the earth or I mean are y'all trying no it means that he made time stop that's all it means amen. amen and he extended a day what is God demonstrating I have power over nature itself and Hezekiah was looking for a sign and Isaiah said, you want the sundial to go 10 degrees forward or 10 degrees back? He said, well, if it moves 10 degrees forward, that's natural. It would be supernatural if it moved 10 degrees back. And I could uh, see the look on his face when he saw that sundial moving backwards 10 degrees. Can't you? A shock. God has power over the natural. But the mistake we make is that we judge things based on this. We make spiritual decisions based on this. And you and I have to learn to trust in God. We have to learn to look to Christ. By the way, this is one of the ways that He tested the disciples over and over again to try to prepare their faith so that when He ascended back into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father, their faith would carry them through and the church would be established. I mentioned to you recently how they got into the boat and he said, we're going to the other side. Now to them, that was just a casual conversation, right? And they got out in the middle of the sea and the waves were filling up the boat and the disciples were frantic, finally rushing in to wake the Lord from his sleep and saying carest thou not that we perish only to have Jesus go out on the bow of the boat and said peace be still and the wind quit blowing and the waves stopped rolling amen, amen. his power that he said to uh, his disciples there are 5,000 men just counting the men I want to feed every one of them and boy they began to get a little worried now listen, you are tested in this area. And a lot of times what we would do is say, Lord, we can't do that. And we would walk away and we would never experience the power of God. We make the same mistake this woman had the well made. And God called you to do something and you knew it was God's leadership it wasn't just a passing thought but God really worked that in your heart don't worry about the resources because you have contact with the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the hills that they are standing on. Amen. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all they that dwell therein. You ever shocked by the pa uh, pastor in Haiti, Brother Casimir, who for years has struggled to feed his own family, to help pastors that are under his watch care? Years he struggled to do that. 
And after the earthquake took so many lives, the streets were filled up with orphans. Some parents just dumped their children off because they couldn't afford to feed them anymore. And he went from 20 to 30 to 50 and now 100 kids. He doesn't call it an orphanage. He calls it a Christian home. Now think about that. You don't have the resources to take care of your own family. You don't have the resources to help with other pastors. And now you're going to take on a hundred feet of hungry children and attempt to feed them? When the natural man would say, no, I'm not going to try that at all. Has that, has that ever scared any of you to think, I don't know if I could do that. Have you ever thought that? Well, God leads. He also provides. Amen? The Lord's always been faithful to do that. I love the little story in 2 Kings chapter 6 when the Syrian army had come against Israel and Elisha was inside the city and the servant was with him and the servant was so fearful and afraid. Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes that he would see. And that servant's eyes were opened up and he saw reality. He saw around the Syrian army a host of God's heavenly angels in fiery chariots ready to defend the prophet and God's people. You see, if we could just see through the eyes that God has given us, we could see that our God is far bigger than the problem, that God can handle any situation, that God can, God can, Sometimes we look at our children we've prayed for for so long that they would come to Christ and Satan whispers in your ear, it's a hopeless case. And you get discouraged and you quit praying only to feel bad about that later on and to take up prayer again (laughs) because you know they must be prayed for, right? God can work in their heart. He can convince them of sin and draw them to Christ. Don't make decisions just on natural things. Seek the will of Christ. Thirdly, Jesus is greater than any other man, greater than all. Remember, He is compared to Solomon. He is compared here to Jacob. That's not much of a comparison in my view. And we make the same mistake as well. As Christians, we make comparisons. Uh, It's not so much in how we value Christ, but we make comparisons along these lines. When we look at other Christians, I don't know how many Christians have been discouraged in their Christian walk because they got their eyes on other Christians. And we start blaming Jesus because of how other Christians are living. We get critical about Christ when we look at a church that's struggling, and the truth is, if we're honest, we're all struggling. Paul said we do wrong if we compare ourselves with others. Right? It's a mistake to say, listen, I'm a great Christian based on looking at those or I'm a struggling Christian based on looking at these others. Look to Christ. And I give you a personal testimony. My dad, I told you a lot of times, uh, when we were growing up, we weren't raised in church, but every once in a while, dad would go to church and he would he would throw the beer out and he would make sure that the women were always wearing dresses and no jewelry and uh, no TV. I mean, he had I mean, He was strict. But it only lasts for a little while. I got saved and I started growing, attending church and started witnessing to my family. And they uh, started attending another church and, and uh, those same old uh, problems came back in Daddy's life. He'd go to church and he thought that God required... Perfection, And so he would get frustrated with his imperfection. And you know what that leads to? That leads to looking at others and their imperfections. Do you know what that leads to? That leads to staying home on Sunday and saying, I don't think there's anyone that wants to live for God. 
The worst thing in the world you can do is compare yourself with other Christians. If you see a Christian that's struggling, the Bible admonishes you to pray for them. Pray for them. That's, that's the admonition. Sometimes we do that with husbands and wives as well. We make these comparisons. And let me also mention this quickly. We do the same thing with pastors. I've seen some pastors that had great influence. They had a lot of people that really trusted and had confidence in them. And then the pastor fell into immorality and sin. And let me tell you what that did to those who were looking to that pastor and had great confidence in him. You know what? Some of their, their faith was almost destroyed. Why is that? Because they were putting that pastor on a level he should never have been put on. Making him almost like he was Christ. Every pastor in this world is just dust. They all have weaknesses. They all have problems. They might not share that behind the pulpit. I don't know if you want them to do that anyway. Uh, uh, but I, I'm here to tell you, they all are struggling. They all are weak. They all need help. No matter how successful they appear, they're just weak, sinful flesh. And without Christ, they can do nothing. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He is far greater than Jacob or Solomon or as they said in his day, Jeremiah, Elijah, or one of the prophets. He is far superior than all of that. He is God robed in flesh. Don't lessen Him to anything less than that. Amen? Amen. And then finally, Jesus gives us true riches. She looked at material blessings. She said, I'd love to have this water so I wouldn't have to come back here over and over again and get water out of this well. Wouldn't that be nice if you never had to drink another glass of water? <laughs> yeah. See, that's what I want, Jesus. I want some material blessings. And let me tell you something. That's where a lot of Christians are. Sadly, that's what Pastors are telling them, come to Jesus and you'll get rich and healthy and won't have any problems in this world. Let me tell you something, you can't find that in the Bible. It's not there, amen? It's not there. In fact, God sometimes uses things that we would rather have nothing at all to do with and uses those to give us tremendous spiritual blessings. The things that we despise the most, sometimes God uses them to our greatest benefit. i give you the example of the Apostle Paul. Probably one of the greatest Christians that we know of in the Bible but God allowed him to have a thorn in the flesh. He said, a me messenger of Satan buffeted me. We're not told exactly what that thorn is, and I'm glad that God kept that from us. Why you say that, preacher? Well, anybody that had that affliction would think automatically they were on the level Paul was on, right? That's just our tendency, right? I'm just like Paul. No, no. <laughs> And two, we all suffer. We all have thorns. And nobody delights in thorns. Nobody's glad for thorns as far as this material world is concerned. But Paul learned that those thorns brought spiritual power. You get that? And then Paul said, Most gladly, therefore, will I glory... He said something probably none of us would ever say. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in mine infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Because out of that weakness, He gives spiritual strength. If God were to come and 
take every bit of money you had out of the bank account and you was just as poor as poor could be. You know how many Christians would get so discouraged with something like that that they would probably just quit seeking God's face? Because they're counting on these material blessings, right? I shared with a young man the other day, I told you, what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? Right? It's not those things, material things that we can get from Christ that we are to be pursuing. We are to be pursuing true blessings, true riches, which are freely made available to us. Be careful. Be careful in your relationship with Christ that you don't let some of these things here hinder you getting close to Him. He's always standing with open arms. The truth is He loves to spend time with you. Amen? Amen? One of the purposes of Calvary was so He could restore fellowship with us. He died on the cross so that we could come into His arms. Isn't that good? He wants fellowship. No matter how rotten and ungodly and unclean you feel, I promise you, He's just like the prodigal's father standing with outstretched arms waiting to embrace you. He loves you and He will always welcome you. Amen? Amen. He has power over the natural. Don't get fixated on what seems to be little or lack are just numbers and facts and figures. We have to look up higher to a God that can control all things, that can meet all needs, that can feed a multitude with just a little boy's lunch. Amen? God can do miraculous things. And I wonder sometimes if we're anticipating that. We look at what's going on and we, 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 we don't see a miracle and we quit even believing that a miracle could take place when we worship a God who is miraculous in His power. He can change any heart, save any soul, accomplish His will no matter how difficult it appears to be in this world. Amen? He's able. He's uncomparable. There's nobody like Jesus. Amen? Nobody loves like Christ. Nobody cares like Christ. Nobody gives like Christ. Nobody is wise as Christ. No one knows all things as Christ does. Nobody is holy as Jesus. Amen? Amen. Don't reduce Him. When all others fail, I promise you this, Jesus will never fail. Never fail. Amen. And don't do these side uh, bargains. God, if you'll do this, then I'll do that. If you get this, it may be the worst thing you ever experienced. Amen? God knows what's best. Trust Him. Amen? And look to Jesus for true riches. Jesus is offering to this woman spiritual life. That's what that water... That's what He's talking about. Spiritual life. And thank God she received it. Amen? Amen? And He's offering to you true spiritual riches. You seek those things from Christ. And I promise you, it'll go well with you spiritually. Don't let the temporal material things sidetrack you. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for today. Thank You.